Welcome everybody to our, our webinar, Brewers Feedback, um, Brewing Modern Lagers with Lal Brew Novo Lager. Uh, this webinar is a follow-up from a previous webinar that we did a few months ago uh, called A Deep Dive into Lager, Traditional Beer Style and Modern Yeast Perspectives that was featuring Matthias Hutzler from Weinstefan. There's a link to our previous webinar in the description for this webinar. In this webinar, we're going to be discussing more specifically brewers feedback, testimonials from brewers who have used Nova Lager over the last few months. Lal Brew Nova Lager is an innovative Saccharomyces pastorianus hybrid that is distinct from traditional lager lineages. In fact, it defines a novel group three lineage um, that is a completely new compared to traditional lineages. La Brune Nova Lager was selected by Lalaman Brewing in collaboration with Renaissance Yeast in Vancouver, BC. Uh, we used non-GMO yeast breeding techniques to select a strain with ideal characteristics for lager brewing, including increased temperature range, faster fermentations, shorter maturation times, lower pitching rates, and a clean and unique flavor profile. And has reduced off flavors, including specific technology that inhibits the formation of hydrogen sulfide. Um, it also has been shown to have biotransformation activity, including beta glucosidase enzyme production. Um, for information about Nova Lager, you can visit the landing page at the bottom, following a button, sign up for new product information at the bottom of the of this Crowdcast webinar. I'm going to hand over the, the presentation to Alexei Titov, who will present a sum summary of the pre-launch trials with our global trial partners. After Alexei is finished, I'll hand, we'll hand it over to some of our, um, some of the brewers um, from these breweries from our global trials, who will speak more specifically about their, their experience using La Brew Nova Lager. That will be featuring John Simpson from Full Steam Brewery and Robert Terharn from Brewery West. Um, after that, we'll have a question period of about 20 minutes. I invite you to use the question, ask a question button at the bottom of the page to write your questions in advance. And we will use that to, um, to ask the questions to the brewers at the end. Uh, with that, I'll leave it, I'll hand it over to Alexi to discuss the global trial summary uh, using La Brew Nova Lager. Go ahead, Alexi. Um, hello, everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me well. Uh, my name is Alexei. Uh, I'm a technical sales manager at Lyman Brewing for uh, Russia and Estonia. And uh, so uh, now we're going to switch uh, off my video. Uh, so you could actually see uh, the presentation and to save some uh, internet traffic as well. Um, just a second. Okay, I hope you can see it. Eric, can you confirm that? You're good, Alexi. Cool. Um, so again, hello everyone. Um, today I'm going to share with you some uh, statistics and a few facts from our uh, global trials. Um, so, uh, as usual, we sent our new strain to each corner of the world uh, for brewers to try and share their experience. Uh, the data I'll show you today um, is taken from their responses on our survey we asked to fill in after the fermentations were complete. Uh, so, from here, we're going to start. Um, and first of all, uh, where we uh, conducted our trials. So um, I uh, won't mention the actual countries, but believe me, there were a lot. Uh, and this pie chart shows us uh, the responses we've got from brewers. Um, and approximately the same number of feedbacks, up to 40%, were uh, we've got from North America and from Europe, and around 20% from Australia region, and a few percent from both Asia and Africa. So uh, we wanted to see uh, how the Novo Lager performs uh, in a different fermentation conditions, 
And that's why we try to cover the wide variety of styles, starting from something easy for, uh, for the yeast, uh, but not a brewer, uh, like Hellas and multiple varieties of Pilsner and Lager, uh, up to darker beer styles like Dunkel or Martin, uh, and also strong and dark Baltic Porter and even Imperial version of it. Um, and of course, we couldn't avoid modern hoppy styles like cold IPA or IPL. Uh, and it seems that uh, during our trials, uh, some brewers even invented a few completely new ones like New England IPL and warm cold IPA. Um, so uh, we'll go along uh, the brewing process. And the first thing we are going to look at uh, is the wort production, as this is the base for future fermentations. Um, we started with the question, uh, what type of mashing was used by brewers? Uh, and I have to say, uh, we were uh, surprised to see that more than a half of brewers were mashing their lagers using the single infusion, uh, which is more uh, typical for ale production. Uh, the more common step mash was performed by approximately 40% of brewers and less than 10% used authentic method of decoction. Uh, throughout trials, we observed fermentations of wort with the original gravity starting with uh, 9 degrees plate and up to 23, which is very different. We also wanted to see how yeast would perform in some levels of nitrogen and generally speaking, nutrient deficiency. So uh, we wanted to know if any types of adjuncts were used, like rice, cornflakes, any types of sugars. Um, so around a third uh, of brewers used some. Uh, but uh, it's fair to mention that the level of adjuncts wasn't significant to truly affect the fermentation performance. Uh, and uh, another logical question was whether brewers used any additional nutrients. Uh, and here, once more, we were pleasantly surprised that around three quarters of brewers used nutrients at some level, no matter if they used adjuncts or not. So we believe that's a very positive trend and the awareness of necessity of nutrients for yeast rises uh, for the brewers. So next, we're going to uh, talk about the fermentation performance. Um, and the first parameter we asked to evaluate uh, was the lag phase period. Uh, as you can see from the graph, uh, more than half of uh, respondents said that it was short or very short. Uh, around 30% uh, said it was average, and just 13% said it was long. Um, uh, so the next was uh, fermentation itself. Uh, and again, around uh, half of brewers uh, said it was short or very short compared <coughs> uh, to yeast strains they used before. Uh, and uh, around 40% uh, said it was average and just a few percent of replies were about long or very long fermentations. Uh, and the last parameter on this graph is uh, maturation period. Uh, as you can see, 40% uh, uh, stays on this uh, very short, short side uh, when around half of brewers said it was average and just 13% said it was long. So what uh, basically we can say uh, based on these statistics? Uh, well, first of all, uh, there is a correlation between the fermentation speed and the pitching rate as well as the fermentation temperature. So the more yeast is pitched and the warmer fermentation is, the higher is its speed and uh, shorter its duration. So if you uh, like to get the real profit of the quantity of Nova Lager yeast you use to get the fermentation faster, you can pitch less yeast and ferment at higher temperatures, closer to uh, like higher level closer to 20C. Um, with the lower pitching rate and lower uh, fermentation temperatures, you will get this average result. But do not forget that uh, for Nova Lager, the pitching rate is still lower than for traditional lager strains. So even this average is the result of just 50 grams per hectoliter pitched in the wort, which is, I think, very, very nice. 
Uh, as for uh, maturation period, it was not related to absorption of, of flavors, but mostly beer clarification, which we'll discuss in a few minutes. Uh, on this slide, uh, I just wanted to show you a few feedbacks uh, from brewers. Uh, so, for example, uh, one brewery in the U.S., they managed to shorten their uh, production cycle and they said that they get this drinkable beer on day 12th instead of 20th. So uh, they saved around a week of uh, production cycle. One of our biggest success, I think, was in Mexico. Um, so they used to produce their beer in 45 days, uh, but with Novo Lager, they shortened the production cycle up to 15 days, saving the whole month for another fermentations. Uh, and another example from brewery in Canada, uh, where um, with their home strain, they were producing lagers in 10 days and then around 18 to 35 days of lagering. But with Nova Lager, they uh, saved two extra days with fermentation and around two weeks with lagering phase. So once again, uh, around 15 days were saved. Um, what about the attenuation? So uh, the range we show on our TDS, which is uh, around 78 to 84 uh, percent, is the exact result that was obtained by half of brewers uh, that took part in our trials. Moreover, around uh, 20 percent uh, beer were fermented even deeper than that. Uh, and uh, around one third of results were less than 77 percent so for dry uh, lager beer which is easy to drink this attenuation range fits perfectly on the other hand uh adding cereals rich in protein like wheat or oat uh high gravity brewing uh let's not forget that the densest beer was around 23 plata so for that case this low attenuation level is quite a common thing uh, another interesting detail about the fermentation is uh, diacetyl rest. And um, as you can see, more than half of brewers, approximately 70, uh, sorry, 65% uh, uh, implemented diacetyl rest during fermentation, and around 35% uh, didn't do that. Um, so it was quite a clear pattern that if brewery fermented their beer above 15 uh, degrees Celsius, uh, they usually implemented the diacetyl rest, keeping the fermentation in a more traditional way. Uh, if it was warmer than 16 uh, degrees Celsius, usually they didn't use this step. Um, the next block uh, here, we're gonna discuss uh, the clarification of the beer. Um, so half of brewers uh, evaluated uh, flocculation of uh, that it was medium, uh, what uh, actually our TDS says. Uh, around 30% said it was high and around 20% uh, said it was low. So interesting fact that uh, in vast majority of cases, uh, low flocculation was connected to uh, the meshing method that was used and it was single infusion. So... Um, even though uh, single infusion is uh, using for uh, well-modified uh, malt, maybe for Pilsner uh, malt, which is not so well-modified, it's not the best practice. Uh, plus to that, uh, using raw materials like special malts or other cereal, again, rich in protein like uh, wheat and oats, uh, we have some cases of that that might be the logical result in uh, low flocculation. So uh, in addition to that, flocculation depended on calcium levels in the wort. Um, the next question was uh, regarding clarification method that was used by brewers. And uh, around 35% didn't use any, 40% uh, used findings. So this uh, three quarters of all cases uh, really shows the picture of uh, craft brewing uh, when, uh, like, let, let's say brewers don't have enough um, funds to uh, afford centrifugal filtration. This, like, uh, 
let's say, toys for bigger players. But it's a good thing that we've uh, got some responses from them as well. So around 12% use centrifuge and 15% of filtration. And the most important thing is uh, if brewers were satisfied with the clarity, with the result of the final beer, and in 90% of cases, they were. So again, I think that's a very good result. Um, in case of uh, beer flavor, you can see um, the comparison of aroma flavor we have on our TDS in blue dots and the average uh, average figures from our trials in orange. So as you can see, the profiles are very similar. Um, I'll stop uh, on a few points here, like uh, red apple, uh, banana, or green apple, for example. So there are variations in flavor perception uh based on raw materials that we used for production of the beer so let's not forget that there were hoppy styles as well uh and the interactions of this uh raw materials with the yeast so that might be the reason of a slightly slight difference uh in uh, result of uh flavor uh as for green apple uh we had a few cases uh like brewers were mentioning the green apple flavor but absence of the oh sorry uh acetaldehyde uh so it wasn't the soft flavor it was mostly again the perception of the full bouquet of this beer and next we're going to discuss uh of flavors uh well first of all of course that's h2s as you can see in 100 percent of cases brewers haven't noticed any level of that of flavor so that uh proves that our uh, patented technology that we used uh, in this new strain is actually working and working perfectly. Um, the next one is diacetyl. And 85% uh, again said uh, that they haven't noticed any level of the soft flavor in their final beer. Uh, just 8% noticed background levels and low level of this of flavor. And um, here I want to uh, to remind you that around 35% of brewers, they didn't use diacetyl rest. So that uh, hasn't affected the perception of this off flavor in the final product. So uh, staying on the warmer side of fermentation without diacetyl rest, you will still get this clean flavor of your beer. Um, the next is SO2, and it goes in pair with the H2S, as this is other sulfur compound. Uh, again, you can see 90% full absence of this OS flavor and just a few percents for background level and low. Uh, and the last one is acetaldehyde. Uh, so again, 72% full absence of, of this of flavor and just a few, uh, like around 18% of background levels and just 10% of low. So please notice that uh, low was the highest level of all of flavors during all our trials. So uh, not a single brewer said that any of these soft flavors were on moderate or high level. So uh, a few more interesting details from the field. Um, first of all, uh, we had a case in Canada when uh, with uh, some issues with the electricity, uh, their cooling went off, and uh, when they got to the brewery in the morning, they saw that their lager was already at uh, uh, the temperature 23 degrees Celsius. And even with that, they still get this neutral and clean beer. Uh, and uh, we had one of uh, very interesting trials in Estonia where we uh, brewed the same wort and with the same... Uh, uh, fermentation conditions like pitching rate. So as I've said, like the word itself was absolutely the same. We uh, sweet, uh, splitted this uh, word to uh, two different uh, fermentation vessel vessels and uh, fermented the first one at 10 degrees Celsius and the second one at 20. So uh, like showing the full range of recommended uh, fermentation temperatures. And the degustation panel couldn't uh, perceive any difference in these beers. Uh, moreover, they uh, even made some kind of uh, lager event at their tap room, and this beer were, was offered to regular customers, and uh, like they were 
uh, asked to uh, guess which one's which, and they couldn't do that. So um, besides that, I uh, used our statistics to show you on this graph. So I uh, split it uh, into two categories. The first one, which were fermented at temperatures lower than 15 uh, C, and another one was fermented at higher temperatures. So as you can see, the flavor profile is uh, approximately the same with a slight variation in tropical fruit, fruit flavor. So uh, the thing is, I'm trying to say, uh, you can get the real profit from warmer fermentations uh, because you pitch less yeast, uh, you can obviously get your product sooner and uh, you don't uh, have to compromise with the flavor. So even at warmer temperatures, you will still get this clean, uh, wonderful product without any off flavors and without significant effect on esters. Um, so uh, the next uh, topic was uh, what brewers like the most from, uh, from trials, from the yeast. And in uh, descending order were mentioned uh, uh, absence of off flavors, fermentation time, uh, ferment temperature range, uh, flavor profile, attenuation, uh, lock phase time, flocculation, and maturation time. And the last question was uh, whether brewers would like to use this yeast again. And uh, again, we can see a very good picture. Around 35% uh, of brewers said that they would gladly switch their core brands to Nova Lager. Around 40% of brewers said that they would use this yeast for uh, occasional seasonal beers. Uh, around 20% said that maybe they would use it, and just 2% said that no, they wouldn't. So, but anyways, like the positive responses are more than uh, 80%. So, uh, we want to thank all the breweries that helped us with the trials and share their data. We really value our friendship and willing to create new amazing beer, beer styles together. Um, and I think that's the end of my presentation. Uh, I think we can move to the second part of our webinar. Thank you, Alexi. Um, as Alexi mentioned, uh, these trials with our global brewing partners are, are one of the most exciting parts of, of our job, I think. Um, working with our trial partners to, um, to get feedback on new products before they hit market is is very useful and I'm really excited about this opportunity to share this data with you and to give the opportunity to people to hear directly from some of the brewers and to ask questions to them as well. So with that I'm going to introduce John Simpson. John is the head brewer at Full Steam Brewery in Durham, North Carolina. He's been in the industry for seven years having previously worked at Mystery Brewing and Botanist and Barrel. John, welcome. Hey. Thanks, Eric. Um, hope everybody's having a good morning. Um, so we've brewed with Nova Lager uh, three times um, at our brewery uh, for the trial. The first time we used it, we were looking at doing a series of um, single hop hoppy pilsners. And so we decided to use it uh, in that beer. Um, for the first time we did it, we used the um, pretty much the same pitch rate and temperature we would use for Diamond, which is our typical lager yeast. Uh, we wanted to do it that way because we wanted to do a one-to-one -one comparison of the two uh, without the variables there. Um, had a really robust fermentation, um, flocked out well for us, low diacetyl. So it was a faster fermentation. Um, I want to say it was around five or six days, um, somewhere in that ballpark for it to finish up. Um, and we were really happy with it. It was really clean, um, and so we wanted to try it again. So when... Um, it became available. We did another Hoppy Pilsner, this time with Nelson Savant Hops. Um, we lowered the pitch rate on that one um, and raised our fermentation temperature up to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and the fermentation was faster on that one for sure. Um, and the really interesting thing with that is I think we did get some buyer transformation. That beer really popped. The hops like were really fantastic. So we were really happy with how that turned out. Um, so we've decided that uh, with the lower pitch rate, the ability to ferment at higher temperatures, uh, the low diacetyl that we've gotten with it, 
that we wanted to try it in one of our core beers. So we've got uh, our Paycheck Pilsner uh, in tank right now with it as a trial. And we're probably going to be switching over to Nova Lager for that beer as long as everything goes good with it. So we're super happy with it. Um, and, uh, I, you know, we tried it in this Hoppy Pilsners, and I really think it made the, the hops shine. Um, they came out really good. So we were really happy. That's great to hear. And the, the biotransformation potential for this strain is something that took us a little bit by surprise. It wasn't something that was specifically selected for um, in, in developing this strain. Um, and we're currently in the process of characterizing that in more detail, but data that we have to date suggests that the, the beta-glucosidase activity of this strain is on the higher side, perhaps one of the higher activities of, of any of our strains. Um, so we're We'll be excited to share that uh, data when we have uh, more detail about that. Yeah, I mean, we've definitely done beers with Nelson before, and, and this one's just outstanding. Um, everyone's really liking it, so yeah. Excellent. Uh, it's great that you've used uh, the Lalbrew Diamond Strain as well as uh, now the, the Lalbrew Nova Lager. Um, I guess I, in general, do you do you have an idea of when you would continue to use Diamond? versus when you would prefer to use Nova Lager in, in new recipes going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think we'll probably switch over to Nova Lager going forward, um, pending the, the trial we're doing with our core Pilsner. Uh, we just want to make sure that the flavor profile stays the same um, since it's one of our biggest sellers. But um, overall, we were just really happy with it. So um, I think that's the direction we're headed in. Do you be looking at uh, moving your your lager production over to Nova Lager completely as your your core lager strain. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. And this is some feedback that we've had from other breweries as well. Is they're they're really looking at uh, changing over their existing lager strain to Nova Lager because of the improved performance. Thank you for the feedback. Yeah. Um, with that, I'm going to invite Robert uh, Turhan to come up as well. Uh, to share his experience using Lalbrew Nova Lager. Robert worked at Brewery West in, for six and a half years, three and a half years in his current role as production manager, and having worked at, for some time in almost every department, including tasting room, sales and deliveries, accounting and production. He completed the professional brewing certificate at, the, at UCSD, which he thought would prepare him for a career in wort production or the cellar, but ultimately led to his current position. He recently moved to San Francisco where he enjoys exploring the outdoor spaces and local beer and brewing scene. Robert, um, thanks for being with us today. Um, can you tell us a bit about your experience using Nova Lager? Uh, yeah, good morning. Um, so we worked with Ambitious Ales out of Long Beach. Uh, this is a collaborative brew. Uh, it was actually plagued by some uh, equipment failures. We had our centrifuge go down for almost two months. Uh, so it was a challenge to get this actually brewed. Um, we actually we wanted to perform more trials or actually, I'm sorry, harvest the yeast and, and try again with another project, but unfortunately we're not able to do that. Uh, we did do a cold IPA, uh, which was a fun project for us. We had been hearing uh, about a lot of breweries doing cold, you know, West Coast IPAs and this new, new style essentially being a sub sub style west coast ipa so we thought we'd give it a try um we used about 70 percent pills uh 25 percent flaked rice and some raw spell um uh, talking with kyle uh from lalaman we uh, thought that the uh, spell might have some of the precursors uh for dial um production um, and we also used Comet at 60 minutes to uh, for biotransformation. Uh, we were curious to explore uh, that. It's not something we've done a lot at. We did notice uh, with that that we got like this uh, fairly early on. We were getting this really nice pink grapefruit kind of character uh, that we attributed to uh, biotransformation. Uh, overall, the fermentation went really well. Um, we went from 15p down to three and a half p in um, eight. I'm sorry, six days. Uh, and then the uh, we dry hopped at that point. We kind of got some hop creep that got us down to uh, to terminal. 
uh, at 2.0. 2 so we saw a really high attenuation, uh, which is really nice. We, we wanted to get something that was uh, really dry, crisp, uh, and neutral from the yeast so that the, the hops would really pop. Uh, and I think we got all of those things out of this beer. Um, we did use a spunning valve and fermented it uh, 63 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, we pretty much, one thing I didn't look at, uh, yeah, so we knocked out at 63 and just let it ride at that temperature uh, and it worked out really well for us. Um, the, yeah, we didn't do a diacetyl rest. Um, we didn't feel it was needed, uh, kind of what you mentioned during the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation earlier. Uh, fermenting at the higher temperature. And we also use a spunding valve uh, set fairly low uh, at six to nine PSI uh, to try to reduce ester production. Um, based on the other feedback it, that you guys got, it, that may not have been necessary, um, but we wanted to make sure that we got a nice clean ferment out of it, or low ester production, I should say. Um, we use cashmere, Motueka, and Hallertau Blanc. Uh, we wanted, you know, citrusy and tropical. Uh, and we hit all those notes. It was clean and crushable and uh, was a really nice beer in the end. Um, we did recently do another project with our uh, our house lager yeast, uh, kind of mimicking the fermentation profile of this. And uh, we did start at a higher gravity. That one, I believe we started at 16 Play-Doh uh, and it finished three and a half Play-Doh. And it did take a little bit longer than the Nova lager. Uh, so I, I would say that this one ferments faster than our house yeast, but because we didn't get to try uh, like an apples to apples type of uh, trial, I, I can't say for sure, just basing it on these two different projects. Um, yeah, flocked out really nice. Uh, we did have some haze, but I, I suspect that was hop haze and not uh, related to the yeast, so. Um, yeah, other than that. Okay, thank you, Robert. Yeah. Um, uh, um, I, guess I, I would invite anybody to, to ask questions using the ask a question button in the bottom of the page um, and we'll address those questions as they come. Uh, in the meantime, I have a few questions to ask myself to, to get us started. Um, th this strain was selected specifically for, um, for improved performance, including uh, a broader temperature range, faster fermentations, lower pitch rates. Something that we've seen in some of these trials is that some brewers are hesitant to push those limits a little bit. Lagers are supposed to be fermented colder, so they might be hesitant to ferment closer to you know, 18, 20 degrees Celsius. Um, after using this strain yourself, um, would you be hesitant at all or would you be interested in pushing this strain further to see how warm you can go with it, how low you can push the, the pitching rate, for example. Um, are you satisfied with the, the performance and would you be interested in seeing if you could push it further? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I definitely would be interested in doing that more. Uh, we kind of headed in that direction with that um, single hot Pilsner series that we were talking about, uh, where the second time we did a, a, a warmer fermentation, um, and I really liked how that one came out. So definitely playing around with it. I think probably for our core beer, if we end up uh, continuing to use Nova Lager and that, that we would probably be a little more conservative um, and, and kind of stay in the wheelhouse for that beer. Uh, yeah, this actually opened the door to the same thing for us. Um, we've been pushing uh, the, the temperature up for, for pitching uh, with lager yeast, uh, at least for the growth phase, uh, and we've been lowering our pitch rates. Uh, so this has opened the door for us to explore those options. Um, I think our last lager we pitched it maybe 0.45 mil cells per degree Plato. Uh, and then we knocked it down, um, pitched it 65 Fahrenheit, and then knocked it down to 55 Fahrenheit and had uh, a great fermentation. After a day, sorry, I should add that. Um, it was about 24 hours that we lowered the temperature on it. 
Uh, we have one question from, um, uh, does the energy cost for cooling, uh, is the energy cost for cooling a real issue uh, for you? And uh, does Novologger help to reduce this cost? Is that something that you guys are concerned about? And I don't think it's something that we really thought about while we were doing it. Yeah, same here. Yeah. This is something that we've uh, we've had questions about in particular with uh, with regards to quike strains with the warm fermentation and potential cost savings. Um, and th this discussion is starting to spill over into um, other strains like uh, the Nova Lager strain, since it, it does have a, a higher temperature tolerance. Um, uh, it would be interesting to see what the feedback is from from the brewing community about that. I, I, ex I expect that there would be some cost, cost savings, but we don't really have data on that yet. Um, yeah. Um, I had a question about uh, repitching. Uh, we've had some some feedback uh, from our trials that this this strain is repitchable, and there there aren't any, aren't any issues with that. Have you guys repitched this strain? What was your experience with that? We have not yet because our three beers that we did were too far apart. Um, so if we end up using it for our core, we probably would be trying that, but just the timing of the beers didn't work out for us to do it. Pretty much the same situation for us. Uh, our, our schedule is really impacted due to the, uh, the equipment being down. So we had to just switch gears right back to core brands uh, to get caught back up. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, I, I asked, uh, Robert, I asked this question already to John, but um, I guess in, in which cases and which types of recipes would you specifically choose to use Nova Lager over other lager strains such as uh, Diamond? I don't think we'd necessarily switch to use it in our core brand, uh, uh, Pilsner at least. Um, that's kind of one that we're for the most part hands off on, um, but I could definitely see using it um, the same for specialty beers, uh, same thing. Like we've been doing some trials with uh, West Coast IPAs using log strains and we've been really happy with the results. And I can see this one being even better than probably our hop strain uh, because it does have uh, faster fermentation um, and was overall really clean. And I, I really enjoyed the, uh, the bio transformation uh, aspect of it. Um, I, I do think it really made the hops pop uh, and made for, for a great beer. Yeah, we're really excited about the, the biotransformation potential, especially considering it was something that surprised us a bit and it wasn't specifically uh, selected. Um, in general, we, I, we, I just I'll ask a, a general style question. We, we talk about Nova Lager as being a, a modern lager strain, a traditional Lager strains um, were selected in European breweries over hundreds of years of uh, selection repitching, and there hasn't been significant um, development in lager strains for hundreds of years. This is the first major advance in um, in lager yeast genetics in hundreds of years. And we're also seeing an emergence of modern lager styles, like hoppy lager styles um, and other innovative lager styles. Do you have any? comment on where lager styles are are going in general and and um, in terms of um, innovative styles and how a, a, a strain like Nova Lager might be able to serve those needs. Um, we've seen a big trend just towards lagers in general, especially uh, I think being in Southern California, there's a lot of producers uh, of, of hoppy lagers. Um, I think the market wants something a little bit lighter, uh, but still full flavor. Um, somewhat of an extension of the uh, uh, lower alcohol IPAs that were going around for a while. Um, and I think this this strength really uh, fit into that kind of uh, portfolio, I guess. Um, yeah, especially with the biotransformation. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of where we're headed with the, the, the series of lagers that we're doing. Um, they're about 40 IBU, so they're not like overly hoppy, but um, just enough to be 
present and and um, easy drinking. So with what we saw on the last trial of it with the Nelson hops, like I definitely would keep using it for those beers because the hops just really um, were expressed really well with it. That's great to hear. Uh, we have another question um, related to bottle conditioning. Uh, John, Robert, I, I don't think that you were bottle conditioning these beers, right? Um, Alexi, uh, maybe this is a better question for you. And uh, do you know uh, if any of the, our trials have been bottle conditioned? The question is, is this yeast still robust enough after fermentation to carbonate bottles after packaging? Um, so we haven't tried uh, bottle conditioning with this uh, yeast yet. And um, so we haven't even released uh, this yeast for home brewers. So we uh, haven't checked that uh, so far. But uh, as far as I know, a few cases uh, uh, from our trials was uh, with the fermentation under uh, pressure. And it was around uh, uh, one bar, I think. And it worked pretty nice yeah one bar it's not it, obviously it's lower than bottle conditioning but we haven't checked with uh, more pressure than that so far just uh, to follow up on that um, given the the genetic lineage um, the the background um, for this strain includes one strain that is a, a wine strain uh, that was used as part of the breeding program wine strains tend to be quite robust and uh, stress tolerant mm -hmm. Um, given the temperature tolerance and general stress tolerance of, of this yeast, I don't expect that there would be any issues with using it as a bottle conditioning strain. That said, <clears throat> we generally recommend to use a dedicated bottle conditioning strain such as CBC1 just to have the most consistent results uh, knowing that you have a, a known number of highly viable cells at bottle conditioning it will tend to give you the most consistent results. Um, but you could very likely use this strain as well uh, as a bottle conditioning strain. Um, other questions, uh, how long did you dry hop and did you remove any dry hops for the lagering phase? We dry hopped after seven days uh, and then dropped hops uh, each day. And we didn't do much of a lagering phase um, just due to trying to uh, dry hop warm. And then it, it was clean and didn't, didn't necessarily apply to the beer we were doing, I guess. Yeah, and I think we dry hopped on day five um, and then just did a cone dump. Um, and our lagering time was pretty short too on that beer. Yeah, so I'm generally not I'm dropping hops from the cone, but not specifically removing them for an extended lagering period. Um, this is something I think that we've seen in general um, for lagers uh, during these uh, these trials in general is that lagering times tended to be much shorter. Part of the reason for that being that uh, this strain is very clean fermenting. It doesn't produce any H2S and it produces very low levels of uh, diacetyl. So there's less need to lager it for an extended period to clean up those flavors. Uh, another question um, about how many breweries were involved in these pre-launch trials. Uh, Alexi, I know that we haven't had 100% um, of the the breweries responding with data yet, but approximation, how, how many um, how many trials have we had here? Yeah, I just wanted to explain that. So uh, just off the top of my head, uh, my presentation was based on uh, feedback on our survey and it was around 46 breweries around the world. Uh, we've also asked breweries to fill in the Excel file, uh, like entering more uh, data on their fermentations. And uh, there are another around 15 breweries, I guess. So it's around 60 already. Uh, and yes, we haven't got any replies from some of them. So it's even more than that. So at least 60 breweries give us their data. 
And I think it was um, another part, like how we select uh, the participants. Uh, well, it's just like dear friends of ours. So, uh, <laughs> and I think the willing to participate was the the main criteria. So, yeah. Um, final, uh, another question: When will Novelogger be available in eleven gram sachets? Uh, we expect it should be available in. Um, beginning of January. Um, it's possible some places may start to get it sometime in December, but given um, given the the slowdown in shipping around Christmas time, um, you're more likely to see it on the shelves in early January. Another question: uh, How is the flavor profile and stability using the yeast for low alcohol lager beers? Uh, well, unfortunately, uh, our, our trial didn't, I wouldn't consider it low gravity. Uh, we ended up a little bit over 7% ABV. Yeah, I think we were 6.5, somewhere around there. So, Alexi, do you have a, an idea from the the trial summary? How many breweries were using No, the lowest the uh, original gravity was around 9, and still we got beer with approximately 4 ABV, so we haven't used it for... Uh, really low alcohol beer. Um, so depending on uh, what are we talking about here, like if we want to get close to a non-alcohol beer, then obviously we need to like stop the fermentation and we wouldn't, wouldn't get this uh, so many esters as we could from the complete fermentation. Uh, so I think basically uh, they would uh, work in the same way as other yeasts uh, with... Uh, low alcohol fermentations. There are a few uh, methods that you can use. Uh, so as I have said, uh, stop the fermentation at some point or uh, high temperature meshing. Uh, but uh, mostly we recommend the yeast strains which not metabolize multi-triose to get lower ABV in the, as, as the result. So for lager yeast, I would say stopping the fermentation would be the best option. Okay. It uh, looks like we don't have any other questions. Alexi, do you have anything to add at this point? Um, nope, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Uh, with that, um, I'd like to thank again, John and uh, Robert for joining us today. Um, it's excellent to have feedback directly from the brewers and I'm really happy to share your experience with everybody today at this webinar. Uh, if anybody would like a copy of the slides, I invite you to reach out by sending an email to brewing at lalamon.com. Um, and if you have any other questions, um, uh, we can answer your questions there as well. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending the webinar. And thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.